But as I get into the sermon today, I want to shift into a serious note because I really have, have something on my heart that I really feel like everybody in this room, everybody watching online, and everybody in the whole world needs to hear. But I want to go back to our vision real quick. So pull up that vision uh, just for a moment. Our vision, if you know, if you're here in person, you see it out in the lobbies on the wall. But it's this. Our vision is to see lives what? Transformed through what? Encounters with the love of of Jesus, to see lives transformed through encounters with the love of Jesus. So today I've got a question for you, and the question is this. What does God do in or through a transformed life? And what we're going to do is we're going to pick up, first time I've ever done this, really. I'm going to pick up from my sermon from Easter, and we're going to continue with that. Because last week we talked about grace. Did y'all enjoy last week, Easter weekend? Did y'all enjoy that? Yeah. Go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. It's kind of crazy what happened last week. We broke attendance records last week, which was crazy. It was awesome. But we also saw 316. 316. Isn't that crazy? People who acknowledged Christ, whether they just gave their life to Christ or they rededicated their life to Jesus. Come on, somebody. Woo. All right. All right. And so what I want to do and how I wanted to continue this is it's not just about saying a prayer. There's actually something that comes past, you know, that e experience. Some people would even say it's an emotional experience, you know. I, I've had people ridicule and, and say different things. Now, really, did 316 people really? And I'm like, man, don't even talk to me right now. You know what I'm saying? It's like I will slap you in Jesus' name. As long as you do something and then say in Jesus' name after it, it's godly. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's like, are you serious? Are you serious? But the truth is, when you have an experience, and sometimes it is emotional, emotional experiences are not bad as long as it's just not an emotional experience, okay? There's always a follow-through. Some people say, well, how do you know that's stuck? Here's how I know it's stuck. Your life changed. That's how I know that God's doing something in your life. I'm not saying that, that you just got rid of everything and maybe you're holding on to a couple things right now or you're struggling with some of the things that's going on in your life and you think that your life didn't change because of that. I'm talking about there's a shifting in the spirit in your life. Are y'all with me today? There's like this, this transformation. And to transform, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about a transformed life because to transform means to make a, a thorough or dramatic change. A thorough or dramatic change. You ever looked at somebody and said, man, they changed. They just changed. Something happened. I mean, this could go good or this could go bad. Have you ever seen somebody when they were transformed maybe into someone who just began to follow the ways of the world? And you look at them and they go, wow, they just changed. Something happened. Well, we're not going to talk about those people today because we're believing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're believing that 316 people along with all of the people that go to our church is going to get on the shore with Jesus. Jesus, and we're going to see lives radically changed through encounters with the love of God, right? But when people change in that dramatic way, they change not only in form, but they change in appearance, right? Or in character. Their character begins to change. See, some of us, we can put on a good show in front of everybody, but your character is not who you are in front of me. Your character is who you are at home. Your character is who you are around your best friends. Your character is who you are when nobody else is around. Come on. And to transform something or someone means to change them completely. And I think that's literally what we've seen on the shore with Peter. He has this conversation, and he just changes completely. Now, if I, if I had to go around the congregation and just say, hey, y'all tell me who Peter was prior to uh, the resurrection and prior to the shore, the conversation he had on shore, right? If I said, hey, tell me who Peter was, some of you may say, oh, well, Peter was a little rough. Peter was rough around the edges. Peter cussed a little bit. Come on. Y'all know somebody like that? Yeah, quit pointing. Um, <clears throat> So, so Peter's rough, he, he's, he's cussing a little bit, he's doing some things, he always has an attitude, he's the first, he's, he's a loud mouth, come on, just a loud mouth, all the time, I don't know why I was looking in this section when I said loud mouth, but um, 
I didn't mean to, you know. Uh, calling you out, Jim. Calling you out. Uh, but but it's, it's just, this is who he was. And it's amazing. You know, I mean, I mean he would even pull out a knife and cut you. Come on. Uh, you ever been around that, them people where they say, I will cut you? <laughs> like, Peter was that guy, you know? And a lot of people was like, Peter will cut your ear off. I'm like, no, no, Peter was not aiming for that ear. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm fixing to cut this dude's ear off. No, he was probably aiming for his head. You know, I'm going to cut his head off. But there was this transform transformation that happened in his life in this moment on the shore. And suddenly, something shifted. I think that we need to be praying for the suddenlies in our life. Amen. That God will completely come in and transform us. And suddenly, we become much better and more attractive. Some of you right now is like, transform me. I want to be more attractive. I'm not talking about an outward attractiveness. I'm talking about an inward person. To where someone who was, who was bad, dirty, inwardly, just, just going down paths that they shouldn't be going, saying things that they shouldn't say, doing things that they shouldn't do. Now beauty is coming from the inside out. There's this inward experience. And because of a true inward experience, there's this outward expression. It's this transformation, right? It's a complete change for the better. And that complete change for the better is not conforming, it's transforming. Come on. Because some people, they think, well, I'm going to change. And when they change, they conform to a specific thing. They conform to the world. Or sometimes you got to watch it because you'll conform to the church that you go to. Come on. Or you'll conform to a specific theology that may have a little bit of scripture in it, but it's twisted. Come on. And you conform and you don't transform, right? Which means you are being changed into a new creation. I don't care what anybody says about you. You're no longer the old person. Quit looking in the mirror and seeing the old person. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, say that word with me, in. Say it again, in, in. He didn't say if, if anyone is in church. Okay? Because we want to be transformed. So, so well, well, Pastor Jamie, I now attend church. Well, you're attending a building. You are the church. What are you talking about? This is not church. This is the building. We just get here and we gather together and you hear some guy yell at you for about 40 minutes and you leave, right? So, so if anyone is in Christ, he is, it doesn't say that he could possibly become. See, when you get in Christ, see, a lot of us what we do is we get out of the boat, we have an encounter with Christ, we don't know how to handle the encounter with Christ, and we get back in the boat, we just get back in the boat. But he says, no, 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 no. If anyone is in Christ, in is to dwell, to stay, to be there, you know? We've got to be in Christ. He is a new creation. The Bible is not a liar. Jesus is not a liar. When you get in him, he will transform your life in such a way that you are now a new creation. And guess what? Old things may pass away. Right? Old things, before you start clapping, listen to the preacher. Old things may pass away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Old things don't just pass. Look, they have passed away. Here, I'm, I'm going to go back to my English te teacher, right? They have, past tense. They have. I call upon the name of the Lord. I encounter the love of Jesus. My life is transformed. I am a brand new creation. Old things have passed away. I don't have to be a drunkard anymore. I don't have to be a drug addict. I don't have to be an adulterer. I don't have to be an adulteress. Come on, I don't have to be a liar or a thief. Come on, or a thug. Come on, somebody. I don't have to be that. Why? Behold, all things, not some things in my life, all things have become new. Yeah. New creation. Everything is becoming new. Transform. Say that with me. Say transform. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we see this scripture where it says, Do not be conformed into the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good, pleasing, and perfect will of God over your life. Right? That word transformed in that moment is the Greek word metamorpho. We'll get deep on you for a minute. We get the word metamorphosis out of it. In other words, that word transform means that it is a total new being. My greatest example, I think, that I could come up with is a caterpillar into a butterfly. And some of us, we're running around and, and just crawling on our little bellies when God has put something on the inside of us that would cause us to fly, but we don't get ourselves in the right atmosphere mm, to be able to become who God has created us to become. Come on. And so we're not transformed. God wants you to fly. You've got wings. Come on, somebody. God wants you to do great things. And I feel like Joe Osteen right now. I mean, he, he does. He wants you to do great things. He's got great plans and a purpose. And you are out here crawling on your belly. God never intended for you to peck with the chickens. He wants you to fly with the eagles. Come on. And some of us, if we don't watch it, we won't fly with the eagles. We'll stay down as an eagle and peck with the chickens because everybody else is pecking with the chickens. Here's what I say. The heck with everybody else. Let's become who God has created us to become. Come on. Transform. Transform. A transformed life is a sold-out life. Come on. We got to sell out playing church. That ought to be my, that, that should be my first week, games people play, church. Yeah. I may have to throw that one in there. Yeah. Like, Y'all ever play like house when you were a kid? Yeah. All you girls, you know, I just almost told off on myself. I never did. <laughs> but all the girls in my family had a bunch of sisters. You know, you're playing house, we just play church, and it's not a sold-out life. It's, it's in one and out the other, you know. It's kind of like hokey pokey. Put your left foot in, put your left foot out. Put something else, I don't even know. Shake it all about, yeah. A transformed life, friend, is a sold out life. It's a surrendered life. It's a life of radical faith. Where you at? You want some radical faith? You got to sell out. You got to go all in. Come on, it's a, it's a life filled with purpose. Do you know your purpose? Well, I just, I just don't know my purpose. Well, if you ain't got no boyfriend, you'll seek him out, and you'll find out who he's going to be, and you'll end up marrying him. So if you don't know your purpose, won't you start seeking your purpose out the way you'd seek a man out or seek a woman out? Come on now. I'm preaching better than y'all shouting. This, my friend, is what happened on the shore with Peter. He sought Christ out. I want to pick up real quick in John chapter 21. This is a really good verse, but I'm going to pick up at the end of that text, and I'm going to end with verse 19, which is what I ended the altar time with last week. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Verse 19. This was spoke, or this he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. Have y'all ever wondered how you're going to die? Jill is probably the world's worst at this. It's a conversation at least bi-weekly. We'll just be going to Nashville down the road. We'll listen to some worship music, and she'll turn it down and go, Hey, honey, can I talk to you for a minute? I wonder how I'm going to die. I'm like, I... I don't know how you're going to die. I mean, I, I kind of wish we knew how we were going to die, maybe how many years we had left. But it's this vast mystery, right? Not for Peter. Because Jesus just looked at Peter and said, Peter, you're going to be crucified. You're going to die a death just like I just died. And then it's almost like there's this shift. And this is how you know if you're sold out or not. You maybe hear something that you don't want to. Anybody want to hear that they're going to be crucified? Anybody? Anybody? Going once, twice, sold to the lady in the long black dress. 
Well, my heart and no blood. Okay, it's terrible. Those old country songs just keep coming back to me, baby. I'm so sorry. So he tells him all of this, and then he says this. When he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Let me show you what your life is going to look like if you follow me. So follow me. And I personally believe this is where it all started. Two words. Follow me. What does that mean? Follow me on the shore? He's just saying, follow me. I mean, if you look at it, look at what Peter was. We just kind of uh, revealed some of the characteristics of Peter prior to the resurrection. And then now start thinking about who Peter had become after the resurrection. Two totally different men. So follow me. What does that mean? What does it look like? I'll tell you what it looks like through this man by the, by the name of Peter that we're talking about. It means a changed life, a new man. Do you want it? Because Peter wanted it. He made the decision to follow Jesus. He didn't make the decision just to come to church. There's a difference. He made a decision to follow Jesus. This had become a seven day a week, 365 days a year responsibility for this man. And when he made that decision, he went from a disciple, which was a follower of, to an apostle, one who was sent forth. From a caterpillar to a butterfly. Am I making any sense? He went from thinking about himself all the time to shifting his focus, and now he was thinking about everybody else. Do you want to know what I personally think? One of the greatest problems in the local church is today, we think about ourselves too much. And when the sermon doesn't fit our needs, and if the worship's not what we like, and if the atmosphere is not what we like, and if it's too cold or too hot or whatever, you can just start doing it. If the kids' ministry is not what we think it should be, then we'll hightail and leave. Maybe it's not about us. And Peter had to come to the realization that this was no longer about him. And what did he do? He began fulfilling and obeying the Word of God. How do I know I'm willing to live a transformed life? Here's how. Begin to obey and fulfill the Word of God in your life. And if you would, turn with me to, uh, let me see, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. All this is going to come back to us because now we're post-resurrection, pre-ascension. This is within the 40 days that Jesus had walked on the earth after coming back from the dead. And he sees the disciples and he says this in 28, 18 of Matthew. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Verse 19, go. Say that with me. Say go. Go therefore and make what? Disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you, that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So, here's what you're probably thinking. What in the heck does that have to do with what you were just talking about? Everything. Because this man by the name of Peter took exactly what he said, and here's what Peter began to do. Peter, bege Peter, <laughs> Peter. hey, Peter. Peter began to teach. Peter began to preach. Peter began to baptize people. Peter began to see signs and wonders and miracles and healings take place. Peter began to apply great faith to his life. Peter began to be very bold. Wow. You know what that is? That is the power of grace. That's the power of what happens on the shore. And sometimes we minimize our shore moments when we should be very sure of what happened on the shore. Come on. You've got to be sure because that's where grace met earth. And when grace got into Peter and his life was transformed, this is who Peter became. A teacher, a preacher, a man who walked around and seen miracles and signs and wonders and healings. Come on. That's who he become. Who will you become? What you going to do? That's a what you, C-H-O-O. -O. What you going to do? Seriously. Just going to go through the motions? Play church? 
Are you going to be who God's called you to be? I know you hear that from this preacher's mouth all the time. But do you really understand that he has a purpose and a call over your life and for your life? Who are you going to be? The sky is the limit. What are you going to be? Are you going to be an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher? You're going to, you're going to function within the fivefold? Are you, are, are you going to be? Who, who are you going to be? Because some of us, we say, I want that. That's what I want. I want signs, miracles, and wonders to follow me. Okay, if you do, then follow him. It's not, it's not just going to happen. Well, I've been attending church for six years, and God ain't done nothing in me. And here this little girl is, and she's been attending church for three weeks. And look at what's happening in her life. God's no respecter of persons. The reason that that girl in three weeks got what you couldn't get in six years is because she immediately got transformed and started following him. You're still trying to debate if it's good enough to follow him. You're still trying to figure it out. Can I, can I actually give this stuff up to have to follow? I don't know if I want to give this stuff up to have to follow him. I want to live my own life. Following him means that you have to get rid of your own life and pick up his life and live his life through you. My gosh, where is this coming from? And some people say, well, you mean to tell me that I could do what Jesus did? Yeah, you can do what Jesus did. And I think Jesus proves that we can do what he did. And I believe, I'm not part of the belief system that different things and giftings and talents and what God has done and the power of the Holy Spirit ceased. They're still in action today. And so, and you say, well, you have to prove that in Scripture. Okay, I will. John chapter 14, verse 12. Let, let's just look. Most assuredly, he's talking to his disciples. I say to you, he who believes in me. There's the key word. You either believe or you don't. You either have faith that he can or you have faith that he can't. One of the two. There's no gray area. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Jesus is raising people from the dead, laying hands on people. People with leprosy is being healed and cleansed. Demons are coming out of people. Some of y'all, y'all need to pray for that. You know what I'm saying? Demons coming out of people. It's just crazy, right? He will do also. And then he goes on and says, greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. I think if Jesus was going to tell us that, that once all Scripture was written and the book was made, everything ceased, he would have let us know right there in John 14. He would have said, hey, 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 all these, just take advantage of it, guys, because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of things that's going to happen, greater things you're going to do, and all this stuff is going to happen, but it'll cease one day. It will when there's a trumpet. When the perfect has come, and we're in heaven, I won't have to be prophesied to anymore because I'll be with a man whom all prophecy points back to. Come on. And all of this stuff, all of this stuff started with obedience. Follow me. Right? It started with obedience to a promise. I'm fixing to freak some of y'all out. You ready? Holy Spirit. Some people are like, Holy Spirit, now let's don't, let's don't take it. Because everybody ties Holy Spirit into speaking in tongues. When if, if that's all you hear when you hear of Holy Spirit, is all you hear is speaking in tongues, you are so, so shallow in your knowledge in the Word of God. If, if you think that way, you don't even believe as a Trinitarian would believe in the power of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to help us pre-ascension. Are y'all ready? Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, and being assembled together with them. Here he is again, pre-ascension. One of the, well, the last time that he's going to be around the disciples, they're there, they're fixing to watch him ascend into heaven. He says, he says this, he commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. There's a promise. We have to wait for it. We live in a microwave generation. We don't want to wait for it, but there's a promise to wait for, which he said, you have heard from me. 
For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now, but you shall receive power. Let's jump down to verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and all throughout Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now let me bring you back to a level. The power of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just so you can speak in tongues. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 debunks that theology. The power of the Holy Spirit is so that you have the power on the inside of you to go tell somebody else about the experience and the transformation that you have in your life. Come on, preaching today. Bless him, Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going with that. But here they are. They're 10 days in an upper room. And then we go to Acts chapter 2. Jesus, I mean, Jesus has ascended into heaven now. And here we go. 10 days later. Acts chapter 2, 2 through 4. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Some of you, you need to open your ears. Let him who has ears, let him hear. Amen. What the Spirit of the Lord is trying to say to the church. And I know that you're hearing me with your physical ears, but you've got to open up your spiritual ears because there came a sound from heaven as of a Russian mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, just lost half the congregation, as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, three claps. Told you. <laughs> see, some people go, oh, see, that's that speaking in tongues thing. You read your Bible. Because if you go back, the power and, and the tongue in Acts chapter 2 was there to witness. This was not a prayer language, which I personally believe in. I believe there's a prayer language. This is not it. This is an interpretal tongue. It would almost be like we were sitting in this room and the Holy Spirit fell upon us and some of us began to speak in other languages. Let me just use me. I began to speak in Spanish and a Hispanic man would stand up and go, who is this? I didn't know Pastor Jamie knew Spanish. He is talking about the promises of God and how God is to be magnified and how Jesus is the the Messiah. You get what I'm saying? So, so many times what we do is we steer away from text because of what we've been taught. When we need to go back and we need to study things for ourselves because this is a prime example that the power of the Holy Spirit came Baptism of the Holy Spirit came. People began to speak in tongues. Why? So that we could have a good church service and nobody knew what anybody was saying? No. If you want my honest opinion, that is out of order. That's a whole nother sermon series. We need to do that one, don't we? Would y'all like that one on the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, three of you again. Okay, let's, let's keep on. The empowerment of a promise combined with a transformed life, change the world. The power of a promise combined with a transformed life changed the world. Now that, my friend, is the empowerment of grace. You want to know the empowerment of grace? Oh. Okay, we could just go through the timeline and the lifeline of Peter and see what Peter did because if you, if you want to know what does it empower me to do to witness, could you imagine being there? And, and here's pretty much what happened, Acts chapter 2. You've got to go back and read it for yourself. Power of the Holy Spirit fell. People began to speak in other tongues. It was different languages. Go back and, and read it. So, so there, was, there was people in Jerusalem dwelling, the Bible says dwelling in Jerusalem at that time of every language. So they're hearing all of these different languages going, wow, wow, wow. And then someone has the audacity in this moment to say, ah, they're just drunk on new wine. And then as soon as they make the comment of, oh, they're just out there, they're just drunk on new wine, who stands up? Come on. Would the real Slim Shady please stand up? And Peter goes, 
And I could only imagine the response from the disciples. Oh, gosh. Set Peter down. He's fixing to cuss everybody out. He's mad. He's upset. But Peter gets up and he begins to preach the gospel. And the funny thing is, he says this. He says, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. He literally says this in the Bible. It's hilarious. He says, no one's drunk yet. <laughs> Go back and read it. I'm like, Go, Peter. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. But he stands up, and he preaches the gospel, and he witnesses to these people, and the Bible says 3,000 men alone. That's not counting any women, no children, anything like that. They come to the knowledge of who God is. Come on. We go to Acts chapter 3, and we see that healing power falls upon him with the lame man at the gate called Beautiful. Woo! Silver or gold, I have none, but what I do have, I'll give unto you freely. Rise up and walk. Come on. I need you to just get up. Just walk. Just walk. Walk that thing out. Walk it out. Walk it out. Yeah, I'm going to walk in the temple with you. And as soon as that happened, guess what happened? The, the rulers of that day come to him, and they begin to persecute Peter and the other disciples. And they literally looked at Peter, and they said this, Don't you dare use the name of Jesus anymore. I don't even want it to come out of your mouth. They left the place, and guess what happened? Jesus. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 that boldness come upon them. Actually, Acts chapter 2, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit again. Which tells me it's not a one-time experience. It's a continual filling. And this time, the Bible does not mention, for those of you that don't like speaking in tongues, it does not mention any tongues. It says they were filled with boldness. Boldness to do what? Preach and witness to other people. And we go on and we see all through the book of Acts, signs, wonders, miracles, radical faith, raising a little girl from the dead. And you're trying to figure out what God can do through you? Yeah, we're trying to figure it out. Jennifer, come on. We're trying to figure it out. What can God, what can God do through me? I just don't know. Truth is, he can do anything for you. But if you want it, it comes with a price. If you want to follow him, it comes with a price. Only yard sales could you go to where what you want to buy doesn't have a price on them. At least the Grisham yard sale. <laughs> May y'all ever been to yard sale like that? It's like, price your stuff. Jill never prices anything at a yard sale. I'm like, Jill, we need to price this. She says, no, we'll just we'll live in the moment. <laughs> like, okay. And in the first person, they're just picking up a, a pair of old underwear from River, you know. <laughs> like, how much is this? And then Jill nudges me, goes, how much? How, how much? How much? How much is this? If you're asking me what this has to do with a sermon, absolutely nothing. But here's what I will tell you. How many of you has ever went to a car dealership and you wanted something, or maybe even to the grocery store or a designer clothing store, and just didn't worry about the price before you went up to pay? See, everything that you want, everything you desire, it comes with a price. And if you don't like it when it don't come with a price, you just want to do your own thing, just try this today. Go to Kroger. Fill up your cart and just walk out. <laughs> just walk out. Tell them I said to do it. Just walk out. Just go ahead. We got some, we got some people working at Kroger's here today. Just, just walk out. See what happens. It'll still come with a price. <laughs> It'll be a different price. But it's going to come. Everything, everything of value comes with a price. What we're doing is a value. It's going to come in the price. Arrested, imprisoned. You know, people are later in life, and I, Kenzie, you better go on and come on out. Yeah. <laughs> About halfway through my notes. Peter, later on in life, actually, they say probably a year or two before he, he actually got crucified, he wrote 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And he's talking about holiness. Oh, man, if you've never read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, go back and just read. 
And he's talking about all these things that we should do. But in one of the chapters in one of the books, it says this. It says, um, honor the king. He's, he's telling the people to submit to authority. Honor the king. And I don't know if you know this or not, but Nero was the king in those days. And Nero hated Christians so much that he would let, literally arrest Christians and sentence them to death. And he would hang Christians on what we would call light poles. And he would light them on fire so that there could be light in his rose garden. And Peter's going, just honor the king. And that same king, that same Nero, is the one a big fire, go back and study history, but a big fire broke out. And when the fire broke out, I believe it was in Rome, when the fire broke out, Nero blamed the Christians and started persecuting the Christians and then sentencing the Christians to death. And that's when Peter's name was called and he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. You want it? And you want it to be a bed of roses? You want everything to be just hunky-dory when the truth is, even if it's a bed of roses, there were some theologians that taught us that every rose has its thorn. <laughs> Amen? Never cowboy. Yeah, that's terrible, too. I've lost them, Kenzie. Just organ. Switch it to the organ. <laughs> that bring anybody back. But honestly, in closing today, if that's all that God did in Peter's life, which started with two words called follow me, and he was transformed, I wonder what's in store for your life. Because Paul said in the Bible, he said, great and effective doors are open unto me. So there's going to be great and effective doors for us. But the Bible says this too. But my adversaries are many. So all this stuff is going to come to me. I mean, this is going to be really good. But I promise you, you're going to have some adversaries. It's going to be tough. Anybody in here? You ready? It's going to be tough. But let me tell you this, in closing, it'll be the best thing that you've ever done in your whole life. So I pray right now, if you would, bow your heads, close your eyes. I just pray right now, Jesus, that we all accept this transformed life that you have in store for us. God, and we understand that this life is going to come with a price. There's a huge price tag on it. It may even cost us our life. But it's worth it because you have promised us and given us, through this transformed life, eternal life. Oh, man, so exciting. Thank you, God, for what you did on the cross. But also, also thank you, Jesus, for that 40 days of instruction and inspiration and encouragement that you gave us after your resurrection, before your ascension. And as you ascended, I thank you, God, for the promise, this comforter, this, this, this God, this counselor that we have called the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that you've promised us and blessed us with all these things. And maybe you're in this room today. Maybe you're viewing in online right now and you say, hey, man, let's back up. Because here I am on, on Easter Sunday, or maybe you wasn't here Easter Sunday, but you found yourself as one of those 316 people. But you also found yourself slipping right back into the same old man. And you're trying to figure out, how do I live a transformed life? And I'll tell you that 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe there's just some confession that needs to happen. And after you confess today, I want you to pray for that transformed life. If that's you today and you need to confess, you need to pray for that, raise your hand up. Come on, no hesitation, thank you. I'm not gonna make you come up here today. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Several people in the room, several people in the room, yes, yes. Here's what I want to do. Let me pray a prayer with you. Say, Jesus. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I ask for forgiveness of my sin today. You are good. 
because you are God. From this moment on, use me, change me, transform me. God, I pray today that it happens suddenly, that I don't have to wait, that you understand that I'm giving up my will and I'm going all in for you. Right now in this moment, I give you everything. Thank you for saving my soul and for becoming my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap today.